This is the moment you've all been waiting for. DC and RC. Welcome to a brand new episode of DC. Coming here from Lafayette, Louisiana. It's DC and RC. Hailing from the world, Louisiana. It's fight night. Catch your right hook and your right eye. Change how you look. Daniel, call me yeah. And Ryan Clark, the champs are here. With battle scars, it's warfare. Louisiana's in the air. From the railroad to Lafayette to Los Angeles to Times Square. I could go one show without you going, I'm Super Bowl champ. When the mic's on, it's showtime. DC and RC, we win in Super Bowls and Emmys. And Daniel got two belts around the belly. Oh, you see history! I'm DC, two division champ. I ran the UFC. Cause we asking all, all the tough questions. This guy's the worst, I see. I don't know how you can do a show. DC, you broke my heart. This is MMA, makes martial all stars. And we bout that grind and pound, so be on guard. And we going round for round, cause we want it all. But there can only be one in the octagon. DC and RC, DC and RC, DC and RC, ESPN, tune in to see. What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of DC and RC. I'm Daniel Cormier. That's Ryan Clark. RC, I know you're in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, as always. But as much as I feel like you screwed me by not answering my phone call 10 times this week, nobody's feeling as bad as the Florida State Seminoles. Bro, y'all got some crooked people in football. Everybody want to talk about the judging when it comes to mixed martial arts like we crooked. Boy, y'all got some crooked people in football. I cannot believe what's going on over there, RC. Are you serious? Because you get to play in a sport that number nine can fight for the championship, like the football is different. I will say this, DC, though, because I feel for the Florida State Seminoles. And you think about their coach, Mm -hmm. Coach Norvell, those people did everything they should and could to deserve that spot. They scheduled great non-conference games. They won 13 games. They won their conference. They did everything that you're supposed to do, which was why on Saturday night I said, I think they'll put them in. Because to me, it was the the easiest choice to defend, right? I said... If it was somebody ask you, well, why is Florida State in? They're not one of the best four. It won't give you the best games. You say, because of all of the criteria they filled. The college football playoff committee actually did the hard thing, D.C. And, two, they dead wrong, bro. They wrong. I get it. You might get the best four games. It might be exciting. But them people earn the right, bro. They earn the right to lose. R.C., R.C., they're about as wrong as you are for not answering my phone call. Look, you are a you are a politician by just ignoring that you didn't answer the phone for me ten times. Guys, you never coming up on the me. show. <laughs> coming up on the show, guys, we have a new contender at lightweight. Also, Michael Chandler addressed Conor McGregor, and as always, we tap in or we tap out. RC, outside of the bad friendship that you have provided me with over the course of the last few months, we share a common interest in fighting. Last weekend, regardless of what you think, the eye test was passed, and you are now knowing. Anytime you look at Armand Sarukian, this dude yeah, is buddy. the real deal. How impressed were you with his victory over Benil Daryush on Saturday night in Austin? I was extremely impressed, especially when you look at that. In his last fight, Benil Dariush was a win away from getting an op- opportunity to fight Islam Mahachev. Had he beaten... Charles Oliveira. And so you look at the run Benil Dariush was on before that fight as well. And we hadn't seen him finished in this manner. Though it did get violent toward the end of the fight against Charles Oliveira, he at least was able to take him down. There was at least some striking exchanges. Armand Sarukin was explosive and it was immediate and it was violent. You know, as soon as you watch Benil Dariush sort of reel back from the knee, the right hand was coming right away. And it was out like a light right there. He jumps on him, the fight's over, he's in the crowd, there's freaking mayhem, because he understood that the way that I beat Benil Dariush puts me in a non 
argument, non-negotiable position to have an opportunity to fight for the belt and very soon. When you're watching it, though, DC, how much do you think the way he won put him in a great position, mm -hmm. even opposed to the person he was fighting? So, so here's, the, here's the difference, RC. I'm a guy, obviously you know how I feel about Islam, but when I see a guy like Armand Sarukian do what he did, now you start to question everything, RC. You start to question yeah. whether or not it should be Charles right away. You start to question yeah. whether or not Justin should be able to wait to get and shot. fight for the belt yeah. after that. There's a, bit of a, there's a bit of a line that's forming at 155, and when you see a guy like Armand Sarukian, who looks like he's supposed to knock people out, go out there and knock people out, you're like, man, I start thinking back to the first fight between Islam and him, even though it was a long time ago. You can't help but wonder, has this kid made their improvements to give himself an opportunity against a dominant champion? The, the thing that was most impressive to me was how calm he was in his approach to a guy in Benil Daryush who has been in the UFC for a real long time, who was just recently on a very, very good run, and who believed that he could go out there and beat Sarukian in the manner in which he did with Gamrot. This wasn't the first time Benil was yeah. facing this type of challenge where he had yeah. the young up-and-coming guy and he had to be he that barrier Gamrot, between yeah. the top five and those guys. He beat Gamrot. This time, he was intent on doing it again. Sarukian put an end to that quickly. RC, when he landed the right hand that dropped Benil Daryush, his foot was in the air. One of the first things you learn yeah. when you're punching someone is to be grounded because you want to take all mm. that force through the ground, through your entire body, into your hand. His leg was in the air, and he hit Benil Daryush and dropped him. And not only dropped him, he knocked him out cold. I am so impressed with Armand Sarukian because he is not just a striker. He's a full-on mixed martial artist, and these young guys, him and... Uh, the kid at 145, that, uh, so what's his name, that's fighting for the belt now against uh, Alexander Volkanov. Um, Who? What did Teporia. you see? The kid that... Teporia. The kid that's Ilya fighting... Teporia. Teporia. Yes, Teporia. Yep. I'm sorry, I drew a blank there. Those guys now are such phenomenal mixed martial artists that you know that they have a chance against anybody they're in the octagon with. It was impressive. And, 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 that's, what's, and that's what's so fun now, right? Because we're always looking for the next up. The, the guy that isn't on the back end of his career, especially at 155, because we're looking at guys like Charles Oliveira, been around an extremely long time, Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, Michael Chandler, Conor McGregor. We need some of these new names to be put into the fold and to be put into the fold that way, right? The excitement well, RC, that some of those RC, fighters have already given us. R RC, here's the thing, right? When you, as, as a person that watches from the outside... You know that when you're putting those names that you just listed against Mahachev or Habib, the two last champions at lightweight, or two, two of the three last champions, it's almost, and I don't want to say this because I can't pick fights, but it feels like you could see the outcome more times than yeah. not. Can Justin Gaethje beat Islam? Yes, I'm pretty sure he could at some point. But can Charles, can all these guys? But you think that if you play a game of, of, of a series you almost feel like those guys would win more. With these guys, these young guys, you don't know. It feels like right. you don't know. Even though you saw him fight Islam once, with the improvements mm -hmm. he's made today, you feel like, okay, there's, there's intrigue again because I don't know yeah. if uh, Islam can beat this guy again. Well, here's, here's what I do know. Armand Sarukian is about all that smoke. He dang near fought Bobby Green in the hotel <laughs> before the fight. Oh, bro. Then he goes out there and he lays out Benil Dariush during the fight. And right after, he grabbed the microphone and asked for another fight with somebody we know is about all that smoke. Islam, it's a different level fighter. But we fought four years ago. Now uh, I was 22 years old. Now I'm 27. So, guys, I got improved. And uh, now next fight is going to be a different one. I'm going to knock him out. That's it. Here is what I love about Oman Sarukian. He wasn't like, if you give me a chance against Islam, I'm going to do better than I did the first time. He said, if you give me a chance, if 27-year-old Oman Sarukian gets the opportunity, I'm going to put Islam Makachev to sleep. 
When you look at that, DC, or you listen to that, combined with the way he competed and performed inside the octagon, should this dude have to wait, or should he be next up to get a shot at Islam Mahachev? That, you know, and that's, that's again, that's what's so interesting, right, RC? It feels like we have a pretty good idea of the way the lightweight division is going to work going forward. We have Charles next. We have Gaethje after that. And then you don't know what was going to happen at the end of the year. But with Sarukian, it makes you question. I don't believe, though, that he's going to jump those guys. So what I think should happen, I don't know if it will happen, is I believe that if Islam fights sometime in the first quarter of the year, you put Sarukian on UFC 300 against Dustin Poirier because Dustin said wow. he wants to fight at that point. You know that Ooh. UFC 300 is somewhere around April. You put him on UFC 300, and then maybe, maybe he comes back at the end of the year for that third fight that Mahachev said he wants. Now you got a guy that just beat one of the biggest names if he can get past Poirier. If he doesn't, Dustin Poirier has now laid claim to the title shot after Justin Gaethje. So it really does bring some stability to this weight class. But, and you know, Ryan, as often as we see guys today say stuff like, I'll wait. I'll wait a year if I have to. I don't care. Armand Sarukian said, if it's not next fight, okay, I'll fight somebody else. And if it's not after yeah. that, okay, I'll fight somebody else again. He doesn't care, bro. He will fight over and over and over until he's an undeniable. And he has yeah. to get a championship opportunity. You know what, though? That's what, if I'm Dana White, I'm like, hell yeah, that's what I want, right? Because you don't want the guy that is the up-and-comer who's saying, I'm only going to fight if I get the championship. You want the dude that you could send to through what I call the superstar maker gauntlet. And here's what I mean. Yes. As well as, well as Armand Sarukian has been fighting. Right, with the only loss in the UFC, I believe it being to Islam Mahachev in his debut. He lost twice. He lost to Gamrot. He lost twice. He lost to Gamrot. Oh, Gamrot. Gamrot beat him as yeah, well. He lost Gamrot, to Gamrot beat him as well. Yes. Right. And so in a when, great when, fight. And so when you, and so when you look at that, you say, well, now we put him against Benil Dariush, and he wins in that fashion. People are starting to say his name. People are starting to know his name. There's a little clamoring for Oman Sarukian to get that opportunity. If you put him up against Dustin Poirier. In UFC 300, and this young kid mm. or this young man is able to win that fight, now you're starting to build a star because it's the, the fact that Dustin Poirier has the two Conor McGregor wins that started to build Dustin Poirier's star a little bigger than it was from even beating a guy like Justin Gaethje. It's Justin Gaethje getting in the all-out wars we've seen him in, and now the head kick to Dustin Poirier that swung him back around to that superstar to where we want to see him in the championship fight. Armand Saruki in his name doesn't carry that sort of weight yet, but if he's willing to fight again and willing to fight at 300 against a guy like Dustin Poirier, if he takes that fight, now you're building that monster you need to have that Islam Mahachev, Armand Saruki in fight be the big card you want it to be. RC, it is a fight that we all want to see, and it's a fight that would be unbelievably fun. But I got a question for you, though, RC. If you're Dustin Poirier, are you taking that fight? Like, are you fighting Armand Sarukian? I mean, especially after what you saw him just do to Benil Daryush? Yes, yes, and, and here's why. There's no way if he doesn't fight Armand Sarukian, he gets an opportunity to fight for the championship before Armand Sarukian. And I don't know if you understand that. Like, they're not going to give Dustin Poirier that chance again before they give it to Sarukian. And so he has an opportunity to do two things. To reintroduce himself into this division as the bad one, right, as a BMF, but also eliminate one of the guys who could get a title shot before him. And so if I'm Dustin Poirier, I take it because it's not like this dude is on the back end of the top 10. He's in the top five. He's an up and comer. He just beat D Benil Dariush in explosive fashion. I can go back out and show this is what I do against someone else who wants to strike. For you, DC, being a guy who got to that point in his career where he was used to headlining pay-per-views, used to fighting for belts, do you think it's too, or how much of a risk 
would it be to fight Armand Sarukian? Well, anytime you fight these young guys, it's risky, right, RC? Like, they don't carry the name value. They don't carry the cachet. They don't, they're not the people that usually walk into the arena to see. Those guys are on prelims. They're in early pay-per-views. They're here to see Dustin Poirier. They're here to see names like Michael Chandler, Conor McGregor. So anytime you fight those guys, sure, it gives the UFC an opportunity to build that next star. But it's the same thing like every single sport and every single combat sport, professional wrestling, all that. When you are trying to build the next star, the next thing, the next thing has to go through the present thing in order to take their place. So are you a guy that's willing to run that risk? Here's the deal, though. Dustin Poirier's from Lafayette. Dustin Poirier ain't scared of nothing. And Dustin Poirier is just a flat-out dog. So if they right. give him that fight, he'll take it. He's a dog. He don't care. Dustin Poirier is an absolute dog, so he'll take the fight. And I think that would be a tremendous addition to UFC 300 or whatever fight that night that they put these dudes on. You know what, DC? That could be one of those... Huge fight nights, to be, to be honest. I, I know you would think it would be on UFC 300. I don't know how that card is going to start to stack out or who will be available to fight. Obviously, there will be a belt on the line that night. But if you get Armand Saruki and, and Dustin Poirier on any card, on a fight night, it's the headliner, right? It's the main event. On even a night like UFC 300, this could be one of those co-main events in the fight that leads up to the main event just because of who these two dudes are and their fighting styles and also how great they've been in the octagon. But let's get to the... Uh, let, let's get to the co-main event from this weekend, which was Jalen Turner and Bobby Green. In this fight, we see Jalen Turner and Bobby Green. They're trading, they're trading, and eventually we see the big, big strike land for Jalen Turner, and Bobby Green is on the ground. He's, he's receiving ground and pound, not necessarily fighting back. In D.C., it almost seemed like Bobby was knocked out, woke back up, and knocked out again. And all on our group chat, we were all speaking about how bad of a stoppage this was, meaning it should have been stopped much earlier. How hard is it for you, a guy who has been inside that octagon, who understands what, that, what that's like, to sit there and watch this happen to Bobby Green? You know, it was tough. I was about to make a bad joke, RC. I was going to say, like, that decision maker was as bad as the college football playoffs, what they did to Florida State. But I will hold my tongue in regards to that. You just made it. But you RC, just made the joke. <laughs> I know I did. I did. I did. You made the joke you anyway. You make the joke without making the joke. You make it without yes. making it. You know, I get it. But it was hard. RC, you want me to tell you what was most telling about that, RC? So, you and I have daughters. And yep. your daughter went to the UFC fight, and she came down to the octagon. We met each other. But she yeah. probably watched those fights all night long. She probably watched them all night long. Yeah. There was a little, there was not, I keep calling her a little girl, but she's probably about 20, 21 years old. She was sitting right. next to the octagon and she was watching. And when that started happening to Bobby Green, she turned away, Ryan. Like wow. she turned away. Like she turned her back to the octagon. That right there tell, tells me that it was too much. Because yep. generally we can watch somebody get finished. We know that the risk of someone getting finished is mm -hmm. going to happen inside the octagon. This, this young lady had sat at the octagon, watched two people get slammed on their head. She had seen a person get choked out, a person get head kicked. She had watched all that, and it never made her have that reaction where it was almost like fear to, to watch. I can't watch this. I can't engage with this anymore. That's how bad that was. It was a horrible stoppage. And very rarely do we sit next to the octagon and I want to yell, stop the fight. I wanted to yell right. stop the fight, bro. Bobby Green, when he got hit, he went loopy, right? He did the chicken dance. When you do the yep. chicken dance, your goal is to not take the next shot because your lip equilibrium is all messed up and you're all jacked around. But if you take the next shot, it knocks you down. This dude right. fell forward. When you fall forward, there's no reason to count in boxing and there's no reason to allow a fighter to really take many much damage on the follow-up shots. Think Manny Pacquiao when Juan Manuel Marquez got him in the, in the, yes. in the fourth or third fight when he fell forward. Yep. It's over. It was over yep. the moment Bobby Green hit the ground, and it was hard to watch him just get beat on uh, by Jalen Turner. 
who honestly, Ryan, had a lot of doubts about taking the fight before he went in. I'm pretty sure he was happy he did with the result that he had. Horrible stoppage show. Yeah, you have... Yeah, I mean, you have to have a lot of issues when you're fighting someone like Bobby Green. You have to take the fight on only a week's notice. You know, uh, another side note is Jalen also missed weight coming into this fight. But when you looked at... Before. You know, or when you before. Saw that, yeah. Before. RC, he missed weight in the last fight by two pounds. This time, RC... We all thought he was going to miss it again. He was saying uh -huh. he was going to miss it. That's probably oh, he where you get it. that from because at the press conference, he was saying yeah. he was going to miss weight, but he actually somehow made the weight. Bro, it was okay, so well. bad that I heard that that his his coaches and cornermen were like banging on his door like, Jalen, we got to go get some weight off in the morning on Thursday before fighter meeting. So he was like, he was ready to miss the weight. But somehow they got that weight off of him. But, yeah, he was very publicly open about saying that he didn't yeah, think he was going to make it. Yeah, I thought he said that. Well, that, that, that's the other piece of it, too. This guy takes this fight on short notice. And the point I was getting to is he didn't even really have an opportunity to prepare for it. But that shows you how difficult of a style his size brings to the octagon. Yep. He's so long, DC, and you watch and you watch Bobby and you saw him. He was sort of, you know, he's always hands down, but Bobby's hands down, right? He's getting hit a couple of times. He'll shrug it off like this or he'll move like this, and then he'd sort of dive in to hit him. You know, he'd stay on the outside, stay on the outside, and then when it was time, he'd lunge at him to try to strike with Jalen. Well, when you get caught, and that's when you talked about sort of the, the chicken legs, now you saw that length, man, with the one, two, wham, bam. And when he's dropped there, DC, it's over. And everybody understood it was over. All of us sitting at home watching knew it was over. And I, the, the reason I respect y'all so much is because your sport is designed to come back from the, um, the uncomebackable, right? When, when a guy is dropped like that, you get an opportunity, maybe you grab hold of him, or maybe you get a limb and can start some submission that gives you an opportunity to recover. That is why you guys are such warriors. But even though you, you're supposed to have an opportunity to defend yourself, you're supposed to be able to defend yourself. And in that moment, Bobby Green was not DC. And I think this is a very bad look for the sport and something needs to be said publicly in some way to show that this referee was wrong. You know what's crazy, RC? And Jalen Turner just went last week and won his 14th professional fight. He's finished every victory. But to yeah. your point earlier about his length, we spoke about that last week on the show. We asked Bobby about the length. How was he going to deal with the range? Because Bobby's a guy that fights behind the shoulders, right? He moves his shoulders. He's yep. kind of got the Philly shell. You can't do that against a guy that's 6'3", 155 pounds. Yes. And he caught himself right. on, the end, on the end of a punch that normally he would not be in range to get hit with. But Jalen Turner was just so uh, good and so long that he landed. He, you know, when these officials make these types of mistakes, I think there should be some sort of punishment. Maybe a fight card sit-out, fight card suspension. And then if it becomes... Uh, something that happens uh, reoccurring, now you start yeah. suspending these dudes for a month, suspending these yep. dudes for two months until eventually you have no opportunity to do it anymore. If, if an official in the NFL continues to make horrible calls and it's universally agreed that it was a horrible call, you will not see that official constantly nope. on the field during football games. They address it. And I think that's the yep. next step in the legitimizing of what mixed martial arts is punishing judges and officials for making these mistakes. Now you might get a warning after the first time. And this might've been his first time. Look, th the referee was a great referee. It, I, I can't remember who it was, but um, it was one of the best referees in the world, but he made a mistake. And whether you're good or whether you're bad, you got to find some sort of punishment for it. Because while the judge who messes up the fight card, goes on and just judges the next fight, that fighter has to live with the consequences of that mistake, and they don't get to move forward. They don't get to just go to the next thing. They got to live in that until the next thing. So, yeah, there should be some punishment, uh, but hats off to Jalen.
it was just hard to watch, man. And you wonder at Bobby's age if that's something that's going to stay with him for a little bit now. RC, my question to you is this, though. When I asked Bobby on Thursday, I said, Bob, I said, do you think it's a distraction to be spending so much time on Armand Sarukian when Jalen Turner is the guy you got to fight this wow. weekend? And Bobby said, I'm going to focus on him when I get in his face for the first time. Because Armand Sarukian and Bobby Green got in like three fights in that hotel. I yeah. think they got into so many altercations. The UFC is going to have to start to kind of reassess whether or not they want to put the all the fighters in one hotel. They might have yep. to split them after that. But, RC, when you're watching that from the outside, did you feel that Bobby Green was making a mistake and that Armand Sarukian was making a mistake? Because, dude, we had the polar opposites, right, RC? Sarukian won. Bobby got flatlined. So which way is the right way. I think you got to just focus on the guy you got to fight. You know what? So here's what I'm going to say. It seems like you guys understand that sometimes stepping inside the octagon is business. Stepping inside the octagon is work. And if my work is done, if my preparation for that is done, then I don't necessarily have to put all my energy there the entire time. Like football is different, right? You work an entire week and you prepare an entire week for that one game. I'm not going to be watching the Ravens if I have to play the Packers tomorrow. But my energy can go other places. On Saturdays, I'd go to the kids' games. On Saturdays, you know, I'd get something to eat before I head to the hotel or whatever it was. I wasn't just like fight, fight, fight. I mean, game, 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 game. So I don't think you necessarily have to be fight, 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 fight. Here is what I will say about Bobby. You picked up Jalen late, right? It, it, it was a, a late change on your fight card. And remember when we asked him about adjusting to the range, and he said, oh, I'm not worried about that. You know, it's like fighting. Once I get in there, I'm just fighting. I think Armand Sarukian's plan up until that point had been a Benil Dariush plan. So it didn't matter mm. where his energy was in the hotel because his entire preparation was for Benil Dariush. His entire last month and a half was with the focus, with his energy toward that night inside the octagon. And so just taking your energy somewhere else for these little pockets of time and some of those distractions may have been good for him because his preparation was focused to where Bobby's was not on Jalen Turner. And I think those were probably the differences in both of the outcomes in those fights, that it's not necessarily your energy going there, it's are you prepared to face what you're facing inside the octagon. Yeah, that was, that's actually a great point, that that Benil was the original opponent, so yep. he was so locked in on him for two, three months that nothing yeah. really changed. Yeah, that makes, that, that, that's a great point. That's why I asked you, because I'm so involved, right? I'm so inside of it. I'm looking at it like, right. wow, these dudes are, like, focusing on the wrong thing. But in reality, it was very hard for uh, Armin Sarukian to not really get focused back on what he had been doing for the last two and a half months. RC, Austin has now become one of the funnest fight cities in the entire Ooh. country. Bro, slam knockouts. We have seen them before. We have seen them before. We have never seen them back-to-back. -back. There are some very famous ones. Rampage Jackson back in Pride, Powerbomb, Pride. Ricardo the, Arona. The main one. Yep. Yeah, the main one. Then Rose Namajunas got spiked against Jessica Andrade. Jessica Andrade. I was in the corner. I was in the corner for a powerbomb, a slam, knockout, Back in the day when Gerald Harris was still in the UFC, I was cornering him, and he slammed the guy, but it was on the prelims. RC, so you've seen it before, but you've never seen him in fights back-to-back. -back. Of the two, which one were you most impressed with when you were watching it? What was your reaction? Dracar close. The reaction I mean, he slammed him on the side of his head. It was crazy. Yeah. So, so, so the reaction for me is this, DC, and, and here is like... I'm always fascinated by technique. I'm always fascinated by the, the ins and out of the grappling. To me, when you are, when someone is trying to submit you and you are able to pick them up by using their submission against them, right? When I can, when I can lift you off of the ground because you have my arm in a certain spot and I can slam you back to the ground hard enough to knock you out accidentally, because in truth, 
I'm just trying to disengage from you. I'm trying to get myself mm -hmm. out of a bad position I've put myself in. To me, that's what's most impressive because it's not necessarily that I'm looking to, to do this in a way that wins me a fight. And I was gonna ask you, how difficult is it in that position to execute a slam versus getting a guy in a spot where I can use my leverage, I can use my legs, legs I can use my strength, when I'm just trying to figure out a way to get out of a bad spot? You know what's crazy? That when you watch it, RC, they're on the ground. They're essentially power lifting the guy up. They're kind of like, like power lifting a dude yeah. that's trying to hold you down with all of his weight to submit you. They come yes. all the way up and then they slam you. Look, when I was watching, you can like those guys run that clip back. RC, the second one, I I look at Bisping and I go, it happened again. You could see me mouth like <laughs> it actually happened again. It happened again. <laughs> like I can't believe that it happened <laughs> two times back to back. <laughs> like it doesn't, it never happens. But watching, I felt like they always tell us, RC, never slam into a submission because it puts you deeper into the submission. Right. But you had two guys that are kind of young in their career, and they didn't recognize that maybe I should try to break the fall. Maybe I should release the submission so that I don't take the full impact of this slam. When Jakar close slammed his opponent, he landed on the side of his head, Ryan. It, I, I mean, it was it, it's it's hard to imagine you not having the awareness to know, oh my goodness, I'm going down in a way that could potentially could be very out. dangerous. Right. Yes. And that and now look, he's pretty good. The other kid that got slammed, he's a rookie. He just came off of the right. contender series. So I could see him making that type of mistake. I'm drawing a blank on the on the kid's name that fought Jakar, but mm -hmm. I can't believe that for a guy that's competed in jiu-jitsu his whole life, that has competed in fighting for as long as he has, didn't recognize it. So while the slam knockouts are great, and they are a very great uh, compliment to the person pulling it off, to me, it's like, how do you not know that you should probably do something to break your fall when you're up in the air like that. My hands always go to the mat, Ryan. Any right. you, anytime I come off my feet, I find the mat with my hands. Imagine when you're playing football. If you were getting blocked, yep, fall so down somebody like block you from the back. You turn, you put your hands down. How could these guys not do that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the I think that's the the hardest part about it though is when you're trying to finish a submission. Sometimes you just don't, you, you, you're too stubborn to let it go. And to me, that's why I love what Cody Brundage did. And so if I had to pick one guy to go with and say that that was the slam I liked the most, it was that I liked Cody because I felt like you're, you're, you're asking someone on the other side to say either you're going to be stubborn enough to hold this submission, right? You're going to be st stubborn enough to stick with what you have or you're going to save yourself. And, you know, people yep. weren't trying to save themselves. But, D.C., you better <laughs> save yourself because we finna have an old school, school UFC war. Rampage Jackson tweeted at you, how is Daniel Cormier, did I spell his name right, going to say he's never seen this? Is he new to MMA? Did he start with only the UFC? Did he not watch Pride? I need him to come on the Jackson podcast. D.C., you've been challenged. You've been asked a question. And right here on DC and RC, you did mention Rampage Jackson. But he said you out here acting brand new. What is your answer <laughs> to, to Rampage? <laughs> RC, no. I am I said that after the Jakar close slam. Because I said I had never seen anybody hit the side of their head and it kind of bounced like that. I, I mean, I don't know if we can show the finish. It was on the prelim, so I'm pretty sure we can. But I'd never really seen someone, Carpet Jake, what did you say? Carpet Jake, Carpet Jake sometimes just gets in my ear and he just has like one word answers, not. Like, what does that mean? I, I, I can't hear you, Jake. Jake goes not in my ear. Anyhow, <laughs> anyhow, dog, 
I've never seen anybody get smashed on the side of their head, bounce up and down, and then just get knocked out because there were no follow-up shots or anything. Sure, Rampage, I saw you slam Ricardo Arona. I watched it, bro. I don't know what you're talking about. And you know how to spell my name. And if you don't know how to spell my name, RC, you want me to tell you how you can spell my name? Spell my name, four-time Hall of Famer. You want to spell my name, RC? Oh. Put a oh four my with gosh. an X in Hall of Fames, and that's how you spell my name. RC, that's how you Corporate spell Jay, my name. Corporate Jake, wake me up Rampage. later. Come on, man. Come wake on, me up, Rampage, Corporate Jake, man. later. RC, RC, <laughs> RC done inducted me into the Louisiana Hall of Fame. Put, that's a, a Rampage Jackson. That's how you spell my name. Four-time Hall of Famer. <laughs> hey, you know what? Since we all know now that you're on four different Hall of Fame lists, can we just do our list of favorite styles or ways to knock folks out? So here we go, DC. We're going to list our favorite finishing moves. I'm going to go first. Yeah. Number yeah, one for me is the front kick, DC. I love the front kick because it's like dudes are all set up, right? They're ready to fight. And then all of a sudden, when they, when they get kicked, they just crumble like this, though, right? Like nobody ever falls yeah, like bad. back, right? Or they don't they don't fall to the side. <laughs> they crumble right down upon themselves. And I think well, Anderson Silva, yeah. uh, Michael Chandler had a great uh, front kick oh, finish man. against Tony Ferguson. Like when you see those finishes, it's absolutely phenomenal. And my second one is the flying knee, right? The flying knee <laughs> to me, I think the the one that sticks out more than any is uh, Jorge Masvidal. Right, Jorge Masvidal, Ben Askren, just coming yeah, right yeah. off of the gate and ending it right away. Who was it that finished Frankie Edgar like that? Was it Corey Sanhagen? Oh, that was Cheeto Vera. Did... That was Cheeto Vera. Yeah. Oh my God. Was it Cheeto Vera? Okay, yeah, like the like, yeah, like the, the, the the Cheeto. Yeah, the, the the flying knee was crazy. And so no, to me, no, sorry, Ryan, the... that's me. That's me wrong. Sanhagen. It was yep. Sanhagen. It was Cheeto Sanhagen. Kicked him in the face. Yes, yeah, Cheeto Hagen. kicked him. Yeah, right, right, right. Cheeto kicked him. Like, that That flying knee was absolutely vicious. And I had to go one submission, and mine would be the arm bar. And I think the, the reason I love the arm bar so much is because it's the way you can see the most pain inflicted. Right? Like, like, like some of the submissions, like the, the rear naked choke. Like, it's cool, and people tap out, but you can't actually <laughs> normally see the, the the sort of pain <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. people are in. The freaking arm bar, them uh, <laughs> AC joints pop, rotator cuffs, elbows, you know what I mean? And it was really the way the world was introduced to Ronda Rousey in the UFC. RC, those are great ones. Like, that front kick, they've had some bad front kicks. And you're right, you will fall where you stand. Because they go, they don't they don't fall back. They just fall right where they, they were. Straight up. And they always go to their knees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they crumble. <laughs> they actually melt. Flying knee, great yeah. arm bar. Here's mine, RC. Nothing beats just a head kick. Because when a head kick is done right, they just go flat backwards. It's one shot, one kill. Do not show Kamaru Usman ESPN. I don't want to see it. Do not show Kamar Usman Bang. as the example. And if you had it loaded up as Usman, just don't show it. Let my words cover this package. The slam, because it's so rare that the slam happens that I like the slam. Dude, last weekend was crazy. And Rampages was crazy. Anytime you pick somebody up and you can slam them on their head and then knock crazy. them out, nuts, nuts. Look at this one. Dude picked him up and he, this is the dude that be twerking too. Hey, this is the brother. Hey, that's the brother that be twerking right there. He be. Tripping, I don't like man. that. <laughs> does, I don't like that. I don't like that dude too much, man. I don't but, uh, like that. They just slam and you go out. And my third one, RC. It's called the Suli of Stretch. Man, that just looked like it. Right, hurt. What, I, I don't that know that picture, one. Uh, you see? RC, watch, watch. That one. It, Zabi did it. Zab, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. That oh. looked like it hurt, bro. Zab <laughs> oh. Oh no, sir. Zabi did it. No, sir. Zabi DC. Did it. The beat did it on the same night as Aljamain Sterling. Hey, bro, look at that, RC. They grab your foot from over the top and they just start making you stretch. You know, RC, as an athlete, when you like in the line at football, it coach go behind you, start pushing you down towards your legs to make you stretch better. Oh, you think DC. That <laughs> Imagine bro, that's that. Hey. Tear your whole hamstring <laughs> off the bones. Hell no. Run that back, Jake. Jake, run that Sully of Stretch back for RC. RC, look at that, RC. Run that back, no, man. man. Look at that, RC. Bro, 
Look at my man leg. But it's also too how he got him caught up around the other leg to make sure you can hold him in the stretch. Nah, bro, you're not finna have all my groin extended, hamstring and glute popping. Oh Hell no. Nah. Hell no. Nah. You take your Nordic track submission, whatever the hell this is, and you keep it. I don't want no parts of this. Oh hey, Jake, are we tapping in and tapping out today or no? Oh my God. Cause DC's That's sweating. funny. DC, I like yours better than okay, mine, Okay, Michael actually. Chandler. No, RC. That was a good list, RC. You had a great list, RC. But that Sulian stretch is the one right there, boy, because that shit just looked like it hurt. All right, Michael Chandler still wants to fight Conor McGregor. RC, this is not a surprise. He said, obviously, he joined USADA. He got back in the USADA testing pool. He's not doing that unless he's actually coming back. So he's trying to wait me out, smoke me out. But I'm going to be here waiting, man. RC, <laughs> I mean, it's not a surprise that he's waiting. Everybody would wait. Michael Chandler. So while Michael Chandler is a very smart guy, this one here seems a bit, uh, dare I say, uh, you can see through it, right? It's very, very uh, transparent that he ain't fighting nobody yeah. else if he got the golden goose in his lap. I'm not, I mean, if they're telling me that is my next fight, I'm not getting another fight until I watch Conor McGregor fight someone else. If you're Michael Chandler, you wait as long as you have to wait because you know no two fights, no three fights are going to equal the payout of fighting Conor McGregor. And so that's a wrap. I'm, I'm with Michael Chandler all the way. He set himself up to do this by being absolutely explosive and exciting every time he steps into the octagon, and he did it the right way. There were coaches on the Ultimate Fighter, and he's supposed to get his fight. I'd wait on my fight. ARC, I'm waiting on the Conor McGregor fight because, uh, let me tell you something. They mess around, call you. Hey, Conor McGregor, if he don't fight Conor McGregor, you never know what they're going to try to bring to you. They might call you up with Armand Sarukian. I mean, really, exactly. RC, you don't know if they're going to, you don't know who they're going to try to call with you. Hey, man, Conor's not fighting. What you think about a fight with Armand Sarukian? <laughs> now you got to fight a dude that has less name value for less money who might be even more That's a better dangerous. fighter. So, I'm with Yeah, Mike. like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Hell no. DC, do I'm you think Michael Connor Taylor. is? Do you think Connor is trying to wait Michael Chandler out? UFC 300. I'm sure of it. I, I don't know it as fact, but he just wants, he probably wants to come back on the biggest fight card that he could be on, and UFC 300 is monumental. Like, being on one of the, like, one of the, the, the century cards, it's amazing. Jones right. and I were supposed to headline that. And then I still fought Anderson Silva. It's something that I'll never forget. So I think it'll be UFC 300. Corporate Jake, let's tap in, baby. Come on. Let's tap in or tap out. All right, guys, let's do it. Uh, John Jones took to Twitter to dispute the fact that he should be stripped of his UFC heavyweight championship. Interim champ Tom Aspinall responded with a swift, you're right. Sorry, John. RC, tap in or tap out. John should be stripped of his title. <laughs> I don't think he should be stripped of his title. But so I tap out. But can we laugh at Tom Aspinall and his response? You're right. Sorry, John. Like, what the hell is that, bro? Like, how does that even, how does that even happen? How does someone send you a paragraph of two tweets and you write back, you're right. Sorry, John. If you're that wrong, right, you should be able, you should have to say something else. Or if you weren't wrong, you should be able to like fire back with at least Four sentences of a tweet. I am very pissed off at Tom Aspinall's <laughs> response to John Jones's tweets, but I do not believe that he should be stripped. I don't think he should be stripped. I think I do believe that Tom Aspinall will be elevated at some point because Jones and Stipe will only fight each other. Tom's response yeah. is not all that bad, RC, because he can't he can't go in to play a game of words with Jones. Because in Jones's tweet, he spoke about fighting legends and all these guys over 15 years. Yeah, John also went through right. some of the nastiest rivalries over the course of 15 years with me you're right. and Rashad and Chael. Like, he knows how to go through that. And if Tom goes through that with him, he's going to get drowned. For as, as, as yeah. like, you know, John Jones, while you might not think he's clever, he has learned enough over a long career at the highest level of the sport to know that you don't yeah, want to play that Alexander game. Gustafson. But I think Tom Aspinall yeah. is kind of trying to no-sell him. He went, yeah, Gustafson too. Yeah. I think he's just trying to no-sell him. Like, ah, whatever. Sorry, John. 
Right. Jake. Okay, so rumors are the UFC is targeting return to Mexico City on February 24th for a fight night and a potential rematch between Yair Rodriguez and Brian Ortega as the main event. DC, tap Ooh. in or tap out on Yair versus Ortega 2. I tap in because isn't that the fight where like Ortega popped his shoulder or something? So the yep. fight didn't like, it didn't really go on. Yep. Yeah, I was there. I, I called that fight. Yeah, I tap in. I think that would be a great fight. And to have Rodriguez versus Ortega in Mexico, I mean, come on, man. It's low-hanging fruit, man. Yep. It's, it's low-hanging fruit. Ortega versus yeah, Rodriguez in Mexico. I'm tapping in. I tap all the way in on this. I mean, Yair is coming off of the loss to uh, Alexander Volkanovsky. Brian Ortega hasn't fought in an extremely long time. This is a fight we didn't get to see in what would feel like its totality. Two of the best in the weight class. I would love to see this at 145. All right, last week ESPN released its yearly 25 under 25 list in MMA, and Aaron Blanchfield sits atop the list. She is currently 24 and doesn't turn 25 until May of 2024. So RC, tap in or tap out, Blanchfield will be a champion before turning 25. I mean, you know what's crazy, Corporate Jake? I've just been so right on this show. And I'm about to be right again. <laughs> Aaron Blanchfield <laughs> will be a champion mm. at 25. I don't know if she'll be one before 25, but Aaron Blanchfield will be a champion mm. and be a champion very soon. You know what? I, 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 I can neither tap in or tap out because then when Aaron Blanchfield fights next, it would be as if I'm picking her fight. So I don't really have to do this one, guys. I'm sorry. I, tap, I don't have to tap in. Or tap out, but boy, Aaron Blanchfield is very impressive a fighter. That's my thing when DC. I don't want to say stuff like this. I just say I can't DC. choose fights when I don't want to answer questions. Last I night, that. last night at the Jacksonville, um, at the Jacksonville Bengals game, somebody screams out, "I love DC and RC," and just jokingly I said, "Here's one rule: DC's always lying." And again, though this isn't a <laughs> lie, this is your way of manipulating the word play and the rules in your favor. Here we go, Corporate Jake. Hey guys, the UFC has a new heavyweight prospect. Let me introduce you to Raubelis de Spain. Standing, Ooh. standing 6'7 and 35 years two. old. He is 4-0 with four first round KOs and his last three fights have lasted a combined 19 seconds. He is also a Taekwondo, a Taekwondo Olympic bronze Wait. medalist. DC, tap in or tap out on the UFC's new prospect. Wait, his last four fights have landed this lasted 19 seconds? Nope, his last four fights have four all... Four fights? Four fights, four first-round knockouts. His last three have lasted a combined 13, 19 seconds. Man, come on, man. Come on, Jake, you making up stuff. Ain't no way. Jake, you are tripping, man. Dude, ain't that nobody knock nobody out in 20... No way, man. I tap out, man. I'm tapping out, man. I ain't never seen nobody knock three people out in 20 seconds. Hey, Ryan, hey. it was crazy when Hamza Chimaya was doing it in a minute. 19 hey, seconds DC. for three fights? Crazy. Here's what I'm going to say. I tap in on him being a new prospect. I tap out on everybody else he didn't fought because they all terrible. Hey, the level of competition. The level of competition. Low. They literally going to pick people up at Sonic or yeah. they picking people up at Burger King to fight this dude, man. DC, no, they didn't drove to Mount Laurel, New Jersey and grab me and threw me in there with him. Because that's how fast no, this damn last fight lasted. Right, guys, I can at least run, DC. 19 seconds. Last, yeah, last you can one. at least run for 15 seconds. Last one. Mike Tyson recently posted footage of him training in a boxing ring. Reminder, Iron Mike is currently 57 years of age. RC, tap in or tap out, Tyson could still be a world champ at age 57. I tap out? But then I start thinking about how many belts there are, and I'm like, maybe I might tap in. Now, I tap out <laughs> on the fact that, uh, that Mike Tyson could be a world champion, but I think to still see that sort of quickness, that sort of explosiveness, it brings me back to being a young kid and watching Mike Tyson and thinking he was the most dangerous man alive. I, I, I tap out because he's 57. Look, man, we saw... Just the other day, I, I saw, like, James Tony fighting Riddick Bowe. It was the craziest thing in the world. Like, these guys should not be fighting anymore. Mike's 57. Mike looks phenomenal. But when they, when they get in the ring is when they see their age. That's when you see yep. their age because they don't move well. It's okay when you're hitting the pads. So I tap out. Mike can't be a world champion. It doesn't matter because Mike doesn't need to be a world champion anymore. He's fine. Because he was He's a world champion, well. DC. Yeah, yeah we get it. A hundred times. Like, 
He's fine. He yeah. doesn't need it anymore. RC, hey, we at DC and RC love to celebrate when good things happen to good people. Nephew just committed to Notre Dame, man. Hey, last weekend, yeah, man. I texted you and you said, I just walked past Touchdown Jesus. It hadn't been known to the public yet, but the boy Jordan Clark is going to stay in college and play another year, and he's going to do it at Notre Dame. Congratulations, Ryan, to you, Jordan, and your entire Clark family. Man, thank you so much, DC. I'm going to tell you what's crazy, bro. My eighth grade year of middle school, for Christmas, I got a Notre Dame jacket. And it was like my most prized possession. I wanted to go to Notre Dame, Notre Dame my entire life. My junior year, they came down and they got my highlight tape. And I remember my head coach, Hank Tierney, walked in. He told me they had my tape. And I was jumping around the weight room. They ended up signing a guy named Brock Williams from Hammond. So they never offered me a scholarship. I never held a grudge because it worked out perfectly for me at LSU. But uh, just being there, man, and knowing that Jordan had worked so hard, for this opportunity, and also, too, that he'd stuck it out so long at Arizona State. He had an opportunity to leave last year. He wanted to give new head coach Kenny Dillingham an opportunity. He wanted to be the part, a part of building something new there because he said, I committed here. I want to try to do my best to rebuild here. And I want to give this shout-out to Kenny, Kenny Dillingham um, on this show. He actually you know, found out Jordan was at Notre Dame while we were there. And he called Marcus Freeman and asked, was Jordan Clark there? When Marcus Freeman answered, yes, you know, Jordan is here on a visit, he raved about Jordan, man, for five to ten minutes about what he was as a leader, how much he worked, how much everyone there at Arizona State loved him. And so to any young kid who Kenny Dillingham walks in your home and tells you that he's going to take care of you, he's going to care about you far beyond what you could do for Arizona State, that's a true testament to what that man is saying to you when he's sitting in your home. Jordan Clark can no longer do something or do things for Kenny Dillingham, but he took his time out to say kind words about him to another head coach who he'll be competing with for other opportunities. And I just wanted to say thank you to Coach Dillingham, thank you to Arizona State, and we are really excited to be a part of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish family. That's crazy, like... Most coaches don't do that. They try to trash the they kid don't, on bro. the way out the door, yeah, knowing man. that they can't get anything out of him anymore. RC, I yep. bet that was a starter jacket too. We all had starter jackets with the with the you hat with the know. starter hat. I yeah. bet that was a starter jacket. I bet I saw boy. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I got one. I had an Atlanta Braves. I got it for Christmas. It was nice, yeah. boy. Those starter jackets was good. RC, hey, you wear it bro, every day, every week. Every single day. RC, I love doing the show every week, man. I appreciate the time. Um, catch us every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcast on YouTube and ESPN2 at Midnight Eastern. RC, you're the man, my brother. Keep winning, dog, my brother. all around the world. Guys, I'm Daniel Cormier. That's Ryan Clark. Until next time, peace. <laughs>